Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 86, The End of a Monster. Before we begin, I'm recording it today on Easter Sunday, and so I'd like to uh, say Christos Vaskresi to my Russian Orthodox brethren, sisters, and to which reply I'm sure you've all gone, Vaistno Vaskresi. What that means is Christos Vaskresi means Christ is risen, Vaistunu Vaskresi, which is the response means he is risen indeed. So there's your little Russian uh, language lesson for the day, and I hope to, that I pronounced it all correctly. Well, last time, we recounted the times after the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. Also, Stalin noticed that his Soviet Union satellites were getting too nationalistic and that both the intelligentsia and military needed reining in. Another great terror was looming on the horizon. Remember last time I ended with a kind of a tease about something Stalin was planning that would have changed the world as we know it. Well, let me first tell the story of what was happening in the USSR in the final years of Joseph Stalin's life. When we look back at the selection of the men who survived the purges of the late 1930s and became Stalin's henchmen, we see a bunch of dependent lackeys, men totally unable to stand up to the boss or make a decision without their leader making it for them. This is what Radzinski says about them in his biography of Stalin. Quote, Who were these henchmen of his? The old powerful favorite, Zhidanov, was in reality a hopeless drunkard, a lackey on whom the boss regularly vented his bad temper. Cunning Beria? It doesn't say much for his cunning that a hundred days after Stalin's death, he failed to spot the very first conspiracy directed against himself. If he can be called cunning at all, it is for his skill in divining the boss's wishes and creating the spurious conspiracies which Stalin wanted to see. Beria, like all of them, was a willing workhorse, and no more. Malenkov, that fat, flabby, cruel toad, as one of his colleagues called him, was left high and dry when his leader died. They all had a paranoid fear of the boss and observed his first commandment, no thinking for yourself. What, pl what Stalin planned to do was to begin to cull his lieutenants as he knew his life was drawing to an end. The old cadre of non-entities, Molotov, Beria, Malenkov and the like, were aging as well. An incident involving Molotov in 1946 signaled to him that there was something coming, and it wasn't going to be pleasant. Molotov received notice that he was going to be elected to receive an honorary membership to the Moscow Academy of Sciences. He accepted it in a telegram that ended, Yours, Molotov. Stalin read that and wrote back to his old pal and said, I was astounded by your telegram. Are you really in ecstasies over your election to honorary membership? What did you mean by signing yourself yours, Molotov? It seems to me that you, as a statesman of the highest category, ought to show more concern for your dignity. Quickly responding, Molotov said, I can see that I have acted stupidly. Thank you for your telegram. Stalin began to cri criticize Molotov openly more and more, and that worried his old friend. Of course, Stalin needed someone to blame for the peace treaty of 1939 between the USSR and Nazi Germany. Since the treaty was called the Ribbentrop-Molotov Treaty, you can guess who the boss had in mind for a scapegoat. Of course, Molotov was a loyal and scared old friend, so Stalin wasn't quick to act. Zhidanov, for his part, was the instigator of the purge of the intelligentsia, and in particular, the dealings with Prokofiev and Shostakovich. Stalin had intimated that he was the person that would succeed the Boros. But, fortunately for Zhidanov, he died of alcoholism in 1949. I say fortunately because whenever Stalin elevated someone, they usually found themselves arrested and shot. Two independent-minded men in the upper echelon of the party were targeted first. Nikolai Alexeyevich Vozhinsky and Alexei Androvich Kuznetsov 
were up-and-coming communists who began to make decisions on their own, which, if you've learned anything about Stalin in the months past, it is, do not make decisions on your own unless you were suicidal. The beginning of the end for the two men was when Viktor Semyonovich Abakumov, former head of Smirsh from 1943 to 1946, was appointed Minister of State Security. Abakumov, who was later to be implicated in the doctor's affair and executed himself in 1954 because of what he was about to do. He concocted something called the Leningrad Plot, which said that Kuznetsov had made a demagogic bid for popularity and that he attempted to alienate the city from the Central Committee. This was all gibberish for, you made an independent decision without confirming things with Comrade Stalin. Basically, what Kuznetsov and Vozhnensky did was to hold a trade fair in Leningrad on January 10th through the 20th of 1949 without asking permission. On September 30th, 1950, Vozhnensky, Kuznetsov, Rodionov Kuznetsov, Popkov, Kapustin, and Lazutin were tried in a kangaroo court and sentenced to death on fabricated charges of embezzlement for, quote, unapproved business in Leningrad. Thousands of others in the city were arrested, convicted, and sent away to labor camps. The purge was on its way. Another target we talked about in the past was about the, uh, and about to get their Stalinistic, Stalinistic comeuppance, were the Jews. Solomon Mikols was a famous Soviet actor, too famous for Stalin, but well-liked. Well he was to be taken out before the JAC, or the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, could be dealt with. On January 13, 1949, he was a victim of a hit-and-run accident. But it was no accident. He was murdered by the order of the boss. A report on the JAC stated, quote, The JAC makes international contacts with bourgeois public figures without observing the proper class approach and exaggerates the Jewish contribution to the achievements of the USSR, which is a manifestation of nationalism. Yeah, but guess who ordered the JAC to make international contacts? Yep, Stalin. He set them up for a future failure and persecution, as I mentioned in a previous podcast. Stalin hesitated early on about the prosecution of Jews because of developments in the Middle East the founding of the nation of Israel. The boss thought he could get his hands into the country, so he invited the future prime minister of the fledgling state, Golda Meir, to Moscow. She was feted by thousands of Jews during her visit, 50,000 showing up outside a synagogue where she celebrated the Jewish New Year. During a, se a reception for her, Paulina Zemchuzina, Molotov's wife, went up to Golda Meir and spoke to her in Yiddish. Meir asked her, You're Jewish? Polina responded by saying, I'm a daughter of the Jewish people. Soon thereafter, though, Israel chose to go to the American side, which rankled Stalin. Now, Stalin was set to destroy the JAC and all of its members. Rodzinski, in his book on Stalin, which is absolute must-read, puts into words the coming craziness that was to fuel the fire of the purges to come. Quote, the campaign quickly degenerated into lunacy. Stalinist historians revealed that the discoveries of Russian scientists had been pirated wholesale by rascally foreigners. It now appeared that the steam engine was invented not by Watt, but by a Siberian skilled workman named Polzunov. The electric light bulb by the Russian Yablochkov, the radio by Popov, not Marconi. The first successful test flight was made by the Russian engineer Mozhaisky, not the Wright brothers, and Petrov, a school teacher, had discovered the electric arc. Now, whatever later Russians had not invented had already been uh, discovered by Mikhail Lomonsov in the 18th century. Well, now many in the JAC were arrested on the ground of being spies for the Americans. All the members of the committee were arrested in 1949, 
but held in prison for a purpose, and that purpose was to arrest and convict Molotov's wife of being a Zionist spy. Members of the JAC were tortured if they didn't implicate her in the purported scheme to set up a Zionist state in the Crimea. Many just confessed to the made-up crime, knowing that it would do no good to do otherwise. All would be executed except for Lena Stern in 1952. A new prison was now constructed in Moscow. It was to hold about 50 people, special people, the elite of the Kremlin. Stalin gave control of the prison to Malenkov and was told that Beria was to have no hand in how it was run. Malenkov, Beria, Molotov were now being watched and they knew that the prison had one special meaning. It was meant for them. Now before World War II, when Stalin planned to have a glorious war to install Bolshevism in as many countries as he could get into, he purged the upper echelon of the Politburo and the whole of the Communist Party. He had to prepare for the coming war with fresh and pliant people. The old ones, the Molotovs, Berias, Malenkovs, are getting soft. Stalin was on the precipice of a new war, a total war with the imperialists, especially the United States. Stalin would invite his Politburo members to his dasha in to party and to eat the night away. It was a tough go for the members of the committee, but they knew if you were invited, you weren't going to die. Molotov was no longer invited, but he came anyway and noticed that his pictures on the walls were quickly disappearing. It was 1952. At a plenary meeting of the Central Committee on October 16, 1952, Stalin, looking weak, gave a long speech in which he began to tear into his former best friends. According to Konstantin Sermonov, the speech was brutal. Here are some of the notes of the writer. Quote, he pitched into Molotov, accusing him of cowardice and defeatism. He spoke of Molotov at length and unsparingly, citing examples of his behavior which have, exist, which have escaped my mind. I realized that Stalin's white-hot anger made these accusations a direct threat. Then he turned on Mikoyan, and his words became angrier and ruder still. There was a terrible silence in the hall. The faces of all the Politburo members were rigid and terrified. They were wondering whom he would attack next. Molotov and Mikoyan were deathly pale. Having demolished Molotov, Stalin mentioned his own age again and said that he could no longer cope with the task entrusted to him. He asked, therefore, to be relieved of his post as Secretary General while remaining on the Chairman of the Council of Ministers. As he said it, he stared at the audience. I saw a look of dread on Malenkov's face, that of a man who realizes that he is in deadly danger. His face his gestures, his eloquently raised hands beseeched those present to reject Comrade Stalin's request. And voices behind Stalin's back hastily called out, No, please stay. At once the whole hall was abuzz with the calls of, No, please stay. Now the Politburo was changed and was now to be called the Presidium. Molotov and Mikoyan were out. They felt a deep sense of doom, and everyone began to distance themselves from the two men. Abakumov, the Minister of State, of State Security, was ordered by Stalin to begin arresting some of Beria's men. But Abakumov was scared of Beria, almost as scared as he was of the boss, which was a bad thing to do. As powerful as Beria was, Stalin was much more dangerous. Now the anti-Semitic rants begin to come out of the Kremlin. Stalin knew that if there's one thing that could get the Russian people in a good mood at the time was a good bashing of the Jews. Anti-Semitism was part of Tsarist Russia, and now the boss would fan the flames. He was preparing his people for war by whipping them up in a frenzy and elevating Stalin's cult of personality 
to such an extreme so that they would do anything for him, including fighting World War III. Remember last week about the plan that would have changed the world had Stalin not died in 1953? That was only uncovered for a short time in 1991. Well, it was plans that Stalin had to declare war on the United States and would send a barrage of nuclear missiles into America with full knowledge that they would fire back and kill millions and millions of Russian civilians. Collateral damage again. He felt that he could afford to do this and that the outcome would be similar to World War II. Lots of early losses, followed by dogged determination, and with support of the Chinese, world domination by the Communist Party. The purging of the old guard was a ruse to put the wheels in motion. Now, listeners, realize that this is not a popular position to take historically. Many more learned men than I would disagree and claim that the evidence is scant that Stalin had planned to do this. I personally feel otherwise. I think too many have provided Stalin with far too much consciousness or, and moral standing. I feel that in this monster's mind, all was on the table. And not only was he willing to pull it off, he had shown a propensity for sacrificing millions for his own purpose. Now, Abakumov, because he hesitated in carrying out Stalin's mission against Beria, was arrested. Abakumov's men, as well as a number of Beria's men, were arrested. Many more were taken off the streets, never to be heard of again. Beria was ordered to create a missile fortification system around Moscow that could prevent nuclear reprisal missiles from the U.S. getting through. Beria knew that this was his death knell, as whenever Stalin gave you a new, big job, as soon as it was done, so were you. The hydrogen bomb was being put together, and when they were ready and produced in large enough numbers, is likely when the war would have commenced. Luckily for the world, the first one was only tested in August 1953, months after Stalin's death. Molotov, Mikoyan, Kaganovich, and Voroshilov were awaiting arrest. The only ones who were going to Stalin's Dacha regularly were Malenkov, Beria, Nikita Khrushchev, and Nikolai Bulganin. They were to be the ones to persecute their elders. Well, three of them would, as Beria was in the boss's crosshair. It was only a matter of time. Right after World War II, Stalin said to Molotov, quote, The First World War delivered one country from capitalist slavery. The second has created this socialist system, and the third will finish imperialism forever. Truly chilling thoughts. As he did with the record trials in the 30s, Stalin created a new trial sure to get the public's attention, the doctor's plot. Here, Stalin created a threat to the Soviet hierarchy, whereby the Kremlin doctors were conspiring to assassinate the country's leaders through poison and other methods. Their foreign masters were the imperialistic Americans. Of course, most of the doctors were Jews, and Stalin was to focus his newly found rage on them. What set Stalin off, or really the excuse that he used to say that something was afoot, was the death of Marshal Choibalsan in Moscow early in 1952. Stalin commented, they die one after another. Shcherbakov, Zhdanov, Dmitrov, Trebalsin. They die so quickly. We must change the old doctors for new ones. The trap was set. The countless men and women signed confessions to crimes that they not only didn't commit, but crimes that never occurred. They were accused of not being Jews, but of being imperialistic Zionists. Fellow Jews in the arts and scientific communities were forced to sign a letter condemning the murderers in white gowns. One person, according to Rozinski, said this about his signing the letter. Yes, we signed that grotesque letter out of animal fear. 
for ourselves and our children. At the same time, I told myself that the doctors could not be saved and that we had to save all the others. To put a stop to the anti-Semitic campaign, we had to distance ourselves, to separate other Jews from the unfortunate, doomed doctors. This letter was to be printed in Pravda on February 2nd, 1953, but Stalin suppressed it as he didn't want to separate the Jews as good ones or bad ones. He wanted them all to be considered enemies of the state. A new set of pogroms, not unlike those undertaken during the time of Alexander III, began with Jews being beaten up in the streets, fired from their jobs, and homes burned. It was just like it was early on in Nazi Germany. Except instead of death camps, they were all to be sent to the gulags in Siberia. There are still traces of buildings that were to be used to house the deported Jews to this day, empty, never used. Pravda did publish an article unveiling the doctor's plot. It read something like this. Vicious spies and killers under the mask of academic physicians. Today, the TASS news agency reported the arrest of a group of saboteur doctors. This terrorist group, uncovered some time ago by organs of state security, had as their goal shortening the lives of leaders of the Soviet Union by means of medical sabotage. Investigation established that participants in the terrorist group exploiting their position as doctors and abusing the trust of their patients, deliberately and viciously undermined their patients' health by making incorrect diagnoses and then killed them with bad and incorrect treatments, covering themselves with a noble and merciful calling of physicians. Men of science, these fiends and killers dishonored the holy banner of science. Having taken the path of monstrous crimes, they defiled the honor of scientists. Among the victims of this band of inhuman beasts were comrades A. A. Zhadanov and A. S. Shesherbakov. The criminals confessed that, taking advantage of the illness of comrade Zhadanov, they intentionally concealed the myocardial infarction, prescribed inadvisable treatments for this serious illness, and thus killed Comrade Zhodanov. Killer doctors, by incorrect use of very powerful medicines and prescription of harmful regimens, shortened the life of Comrade Shesherbukov, leading to his death. The majority of the participants of the terrorist group were bought by American intelligence. They were recruited by a branch office of American intelligence, the international Jewish bourgeois nationalistic organization called Joint, the filthy face of this Zionist spy organization, covering up their vicious actions under the mask of charity, as now completely revealed. Unmasking the gang of poisoner doctors struck a blow against the international J Jewish Zionist organization. Now all can see what sort of philanthropists and friends of peace had beneath the signboard of joint. Other participants in the terrorist group, Vinogradov, Kogan, Igorov, were discovered, as has been presently determined, to have been long-time agents of English intelligence, serving it for many years, carrying out its most criminal and sordid tasks. The bigwigs of the USA and their English junior partners know that to achieve domination over other nations by peaceful means is impossible. Feverishly preparing for a new world war, they energetically send spies inside the USSR and the People's Democratic countries. They attempt to accomplish what the Hitlerites could not do, to create in the USSR their own subversive fifth column. The Soviet people should not for a minute forget about the need to heighten their vigilance and always possible, to be alert for all schemes of warmongers and their agents, to constantly strengthen the armed forces and the intelligence organs of our government. 
It was March 1st, 1953, and after going out all night as was the ritual, Beria, Malenkov, Bulganin, Khrushchev, and Stalin all went to his dasha in Kuntsevo to retire for the night. When morning broke, no one thought it unusual that the boss did not emerge from his room. Then morning became afternoon, then nighttime, and still no comrade Stalin. Peter Lozgachev, the deputy commandant of Kunzevo, entered Stalin's room only to find him on the floor wearing pajama bottoms and a t-shirt, all of which was soaked in urine. He immediately called some party officials to come immediately. It was apparent that Stalin had suffered a massive stroke. Doctors were called after an astonishing 12 hours, but there was little to be done. Now the leaders, the other leaders, knew that the time had come for a new one to come forward and take over from the boss. The question must be asked, why did they wait 12 hours to call the doctors? The answer is quite simple. They were scared and unable to make a snap decision. Stalin had beaten the ability to react to an event without his guidance out of them. They were paralyzed until they realized the boss was not going to recover. The days went on with some of the old men like Molotov, Voroshilov, and Malenkov coming, which showed that while Stalin had no use for them anymore, the others did. But Beria was the obvious one in charge, which made the others very uneasy. There was already talk about what the best way to deal with Beria was going to be. They hated, yet still feared the man. Doctors were brought in to assess Stalin's health, some of them having just been tortured by his order. Professor Lukomsky was brought in under the watchful eye of Beria. He was petrified, and his hands were shaking so badly that he couldn't even take Stalin's pulse. Hold his hand properly, yelled Beria at the now, at the by now almost paralyzed by fear physician. The following is a telling paragraph about the situation around Stalin from Montefiore's book on the boss. Quote, Once it was proved that he was incapacitated, Beria spewed forth his hatred of Stalin. But whenever he would recover, knelt and kissed his hand, like an oriental vizier at a sultan's bedside. When Stalin sank again into sleep, Beria virtually spat at him, revealing his reckless ambition and lack of tact and prudence. The other magnates observed him silently, but they were weeping for Stalin, their old but flawed friend. Longtime leader, historical titan, and the supreme pontiff of their international creed, even as they sighed with relief that he was dying. Perhaps 20 million had been killed, 28 million deported, of whom 18 million had slaved in the gulags. Yet, after so much slaughter, they were still believers. And I'd like you to take a moment to ponder those numbers. Take a moment to ponder the abject suffering of the Russian people when you add the 30 million who died in the war. Count your many blessings tonight when you go to bed that you did not live in those terrible times when Stalin ruled Russia. Count those blessings deeply. Many wish they could have switched places with you. Well, by March 4th, the boss's breathing became more labored and slower. The time was nigh. By the 5th, it was apparent that the end had come, which made Beria, Khrushchev, and Malenkov scurry around Stalin's office, destroying incriminating papers on themselves. At 9.40 p.m., the end came. Svetlana, his daughter had this to say in her memoirs about his last minute. His face was discolored, his features becoming unrecognizable. He literally choked to death as we watched. The death agony was terrible. At the last minute, he opened his eyes. It was a terrible look, either mad or angry, and full of fear of death. He seemed to be 
pointing upwards somewhere or threatening us all. Then the next moment, his spirit, after one last effort, tore itself from his body. The man who had ruled Russia with an iron fist for 30 years was dead. Stalin was revered in his country, and still is today by many. Now, the one positive thing to say about him is had he not forced massive industrialization of his country, it is highly likely that Nazi Germany would have won the war and that our world would have been a very, very different place. But we cannot forget that he was one of the greatest mass murderers of human history, and the pain and suffering he caused is incalculable. The man rightfully goes down in history as being one of the most evil men that ever lived. Now, there were some who would argue that Mao Zedong had killed many more people than Joseph Stalin did, and that he should be considered even more evil than Stalin. But the case that I make is that who did Mao learn from but this barbarous Joseph Jugashvili? He learned the way to murder his people from Stalin, and that's why I consider Stalin the greatest evil in the history of mankind. And I've spent 13 episodes going over him, and I've spent a lot of time studying a lot of other people, Adolf Hitler, uh, many others, Genghis Khan, but to me, Stalin's murderous path was by far the most barbarous. Well, next time, the struggle for power and control of the Soviet Union begins in earnest. Join me as I weave a tale of deceit and cunning as Stalin's cadre of magnates battle each other out for the control of the USSR. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. It was another doozy, and I'm certainly glad to be done with the monster who is Stalin. Sadly, there's a movement in Russia to rehabilitate the man, but I hope that they truly understand what he did and leave it at that. Now, please don't forget to give me a rating on iTunes so I can move up on the charts of history podcasts. That, and don't forget to visit us on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast spot, where you can ask a question, make a comment, or leave a suggestion. So now, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.